Uh, nearly six. We can we can help you out. <laughs> um, I work in Southampton, uh, the Red Star up there. Um, one of the great benefits of working in Southampton is a tremendous amount of documentation, um, which gives us the nitty gritty of trade uh, in the medieval period, particularly. And um, I'm, I'm interested in ceramics and what they can tell us, and that particularly gives us an idea of the economics of a settlement, perhaps what's coming in, um, and perhaps what those people are exchanging. And um, this is just three sites um, that we've worked on recently along the south coast. Um, that coast must be a sort of interface between the rest of Europe, the rest of the world, and the forest. And um, I think sites along the coast are going to provide us with interesting aspects of how the forest functioned in, a, in its sort of wider hinterland. Um, first site at Leap, oh, perhaps we better say, for those of you who don't know, um, the, the green star over to the right is uh, at Leap, um, between uh, Exbury, as you can see on the map. Then the one in the middle is at Buckland, to the north of Lewington, and then the third side down the bottom there is on the coast at Lyminton itself. The leap site was because there was a new gas pipe going to the Isle of Wight. Um, the gas pipe has to go under the sea and interestingly, um, something I, I haven't really thought about, how do you get a gas pipe under the sea? You start off by building the entire pipe on land and then shut it down a hole. <laughs> so that red stripe there is the equivalent distance across the Solent laid out in uh, the edge of the new forest. Um, so they had to strip an area um, big enough to weld all the lengths of pipe together and then drag them down the hole at the bottom. So the site compound was a large area excavated there. Um, the only archaeology on that spot was a pit. It was a very boring pit because it had no artefacts in it. So we carbon dated the charcoal and it was Neolithic. So we do have a small sample of Neolithic <laughs> material that might be of interest to you. As far as I know, it's the only site in the forest uh, with sort of proper evidence of habitation in the Neolithic as opposed to uh, stray flints. So that entire red strip uh, was excavated with diggers and archaeologists kept an eye on it. And when archaeology turned up, um, we sent a team out there. Uh, and uh, Jesse Russell, whose uh, people worked there in rain or shine for a number of months to, uh, to collect the archaeology. The green line you see coming down is the putative Roman road. Um, there's a lovely embankment that runs down that way that's always been called the Roman Road. Recently, doubt has been cast on it, um, and it's been described as a medieval boundary bank. Strangely straight, um, it's more like a sort of railway embankment than any other sort of bank in the forest. Um, and it was interesting to see um, what we got at the end of the Roman Road. Um, this is just the strip um, there must be more archaeology on either side. We have um, at the bottom there uh, a ring ditch, probably the site of a hut, and then we've got a field system with uh, a ditch, a long linear that would be exactly parallel to the Roman road that's a medieval boundary bank. And you can see other landscape divisions here here, 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 which would be running off at right angles from that road system. So that perhaps suggests that this part of the forest maybe was um, divided up landscape fields all based on a Roman road, which one would therefore expect to be early on in the sequence. That Roman road would lead down to Leap, which is perhaps the leaping off point uh, for the Isle of Wight. 
All those red spots are, in some ways, the most interesting aspect. Kilns and hearths. Uh, there's one in the middle of the ring ditch here. Uh, there are a few in the middle, but a concentration up at this end. Most of those hearths cut through earlier uh, Roman features, so they're a feature of the latest aspect of the settlement. That uh, ring ditch you can see there. Um, and the thing to note here, this big flat plain around the area of Leap. It's in between two streams. Uh, the Blackwater River's on the west, um, but also note how close to the surface it is. There's only about 350 mil of topsoil sitting on top of intact road <coughs> deposits um, and complex deposits at that. Um, <coughs> Hopefully you can see those. Um, these are two of the kilns and one of the hearths. Uh, the hearth here sits on a uh, Roman pit full of oyster shells. Um, and clay was collected um, and packed down on top of it and then something on top of that was subject, um, subject to great heat. Uh, no real clues as to what it was. Um, there is a scatter of pop shirts about the place and certainly the kilns, so there's a kiln here, this is half sectioned, this kiln has a stone lining to it, um, as does this one here, again half sectioned. You get a small kiln, no more than a metre across with a little stone hole um, in which the fire was lit. Um, the kilns are made of limestone and the limestone is a mixture of limestone from the Isle of Wight and limestone from Dorset. There is also Roman building material in there. Um, there are tegula, imbrex, and a few bits of flue tile. So, have these people scrounged this material from the nearest Roman villa? Um, the nearest Roman villa probably is on the Isle of Wight. Um, it's, it's interesting to see that you know, a settlement you would think of a very low status has actually got um, bits and pieces from a high status Roman building. So is there a high status Roman building nearby? You'll see that in many archeological reports. We've got some Roman building material, there must be a villa. Um, this is perhaps an area where some research could be done to, to, to look for that villa. Um, what were they doing with these kilns is uh, the thing we wanted to answer. We took soil samples from every kiln and we sieved them. And the surprising thing was we had no charcoal. <coughs> they are not cutting down woodland and burning it here. Um, what we had was very, very fine black soot, basically. Um, and it looks like the I, presumably they're using peat. Um, I'm not sure how hot you can get a peat fire. Um, I don't think you could be smelting iron with it, and certainly there's no signs of hammer scale. One piece of iron slag turned up from the entire site, so these are not iron production. What we did get was lots and lots of late Roman grog-tempered pottery. Um, the biggest proportion on the site. Um, you probably can't see it, but there is a smashed Roman grog-tempered pot uh, down the bottom there, right next to the kiln. Grog-tempered pottery is low-fired and horrible stuff, uh, so it would be difficult to know if it was a waster or not, because it pretty much all looks like wasters when archaeologists get around to digging it up. It's crushed and broken. It's not going to be hot enough to crack or split in the kiln. But, um, you know, is this another aspect of the new forest in the late Roman period? Have we got uh, a different sort of pottery being produced on the south coast? Um, plotting other Roman things around Leap, um, before the work took place, the Roman finds in this area hadn't really been recognised and the evidence pulled together. But um, we found uh, an amateur archaeologist who'd done a lot of research on the Roman road 
um, and in his report it said, and there's lots of Roman building material around Leap Farm, which is this area here. Um, none of it's survived to a museum, but um, tracking down various other sites, every one of those green dots is um, a group of Roman material that has turned up, and there is these green lines here mark the uh, ditches you can see on the air photographs, um, which uh, people have suggested are medieval, but given that coincidence, um, probably are Roman. So it looks like uh, we have a Roman settlement at the end of the Roman road, which makes sense to me. Um, the interesting aspect is how does it react with the shore? That shore is rapidly working its way northwards, so any Roman coastline would have been uh, maybe down here somewhere. Um, people have suggested uh, this area here is a Roman harbour. I don't think that's possible. Sea level would have been much lower then, so ships wouldn't be able to come up that far. But it's an area uh, which certainly needs further research. Uh, moving along the coast to uh, the Sultans at Livington. This is a, a typical watching brief on a uh, large house being constructed on the shoreline. You can see. Uh, the sort of impact that a house, this is just a two-story house, has on the archaeology. Uh, it was very close to the areas of salt works. This is on the uh, uh, early 19th century map. The red circle marks the, uh, the predecessor to the large house. Um, they had gone through a number of uh, rebuilds um, until it burnt down in the 1930s. So this was the, the sort of rebuild of the 30s house. And you can see all those little squares mark the salt pans of the post-medieval industry. We have descriptions of, of how it was done with uh, large salt pans, uh, the, the water evaporating off and then it being boiled in great big lead or cast iron pans. So the idea was uh, could we collect some archaeological evidence uh, for that on this site here? What we actually found was something completely different, as is often the way. Um, you can see the, the blue outlines there mark that house that's shown on the, uh, the first Ordnance Survey map. Um, trenches with brick foundations in and another little building up towards the top. But um, what we mostly found was lots and lots of pits scattered all over the site um, and probably much further and a couple of ditches which seem to demarcate no pits found this way all the pits found on this side um, not many finds turned up to date it but we have some 12th 13th century pottery from the site so it looks like it's a medieval salt works and they're not at all using a system of salt pans or evaporating the water. They have a, a completely different system. Um, it results in lots of pits full of black and red sand. You sieve it, um, again, there's no charcoal in it. All it has is sort of black soot which goes through the sieves and you end up with um, three kilos of lovely white beach sand because that's what it is and um, thanks to Frank and his knowledge of the salt industry uh, we've been able to identify this as the waste from the sleaching process you collect salty sand from the high tide mark take it inland and wash the salt out you then throw the salt and throw the sand away it's a waste product and the sand actually built up into enormous great heaps. Um, this is the 1867 Ordnance Survey map. There is our site and there is a huge linear heap. And this was then sold off in the post-medieval period and used for building mortar. It was beautifully sandy, no salt in it, um, and readily available. So one of the last sort of lumps survived. Elsewhere you can see the remains of the pumping mills that 
dragged water out of the salt pans and took them to the salt houses for boiling. But in the medieval period, there's this much simpler system going on. So we were expecting salt pans. We found none at all um, evidence of the earlier industry. Our last site is uh, where the Red Square is, um, Alexandra Road, Lymington. And um, excavation work and watching brief is still going on. We'll be back on the site on Monday. And um, this is uh, having houses built on it, so it gave us the opportunity to, to have a look at what was there first. As part of the planning process, um, Frank is able to put conditions on and ask for work. So it started off as a desk-based assessment, then geophysics, which led to trial excavations. Of interest uh, in the wider landscape is the green circle, which marks the Iron Age and possibly Neolithic site of Buckland Rings, and the purple one is this mysterious site of Ampress Park. Uh, which appears to be a hill fort built on the edge of a river um, about which more later. The um, early phases gave us some geophysics and you can see there are a number of phases of ditches, some of them very straight, um, assumed to be post-medieval um, and so one of the purple ones had a big cast iron ploughshare in it uh, probably ploughing from the mid-19th century. Um, earlier, sort of orangey set of sort of linear, but all coming down to this point here, and then these yellowy things that sort of wander across the site, much more curvilinear. Um, so the trial trenches were put to examine the geophysics and also areas in between the geophysics. And, um, Trench 12 in this gap in the geophysics is the one that produced uh, the interesting results. Uh, others in gaps in the geophysics found absolutely nothing, suggesting the geophysics was right. Um, with Trench 12, it's just that the geophysics couldn't pick up the archaeology that is there. Uh, trench 12 produced a mass of post holes and a nice pit, pit 27, at the north end of the trench. And uh, Matt Garner and his team uh, did the evaluation work and then we presented the results to Frank Green at the National Park and he said, right, we need to have an area excavation to look at the whole thing. Um, while we were waiting on that, we did some analysis on the pit. Um, the finds in it were intriguing. German lava quern stones and animal bones. And we were thinking, well, the geophysics looks like a sort of Iron Age. We've got very little pottery at all. One Roman shirt came out of the ditch. But lava quern stones look like what we're used to finding in Southampton in Hamwick, the Middle Saxon town. And uh, so while we were waiting for the next phase of work to take place, we sent off some uh, animal teeth from that pit. And we got up. Uh, here is the pit itself, not enormous, it's not like a rubbish pit in Hamwick which would be two metres deep and stuffed full of bone and oyster shells. So this is a different sort of settlement. But the teeth, which you can see uh, here, very long and thin. Uh, people are still debating over what it is. Lumps of quern stone, so this was a quern for grinding corn that came from uh, the Rhineland. Upper Rhineland Valley traded across to this country, and fragments of daub from around where the post holes were. The date came back as between 775 and 885 AD. So this is um, the sort of period when Hamwick is uh, going into decline, uh, the Vikings are coming around. So of interest what's going on here we stripped off a much larger area and found dozens and dozens of post holes it looks like there is an iron age settlement here um, we've got ring ditches uh, another one coming through here those didn't show up on the geophysics 
and nor did all the post tunnels. We have a big rectangular hall here with an annex on the side. Um, the charcoal has been looked at from here and it consists of, uh, that's the size of the structure. The charcoal is either oak from big trees or hazel from uh, hazel that has been cut down between five and seven years old. So perfect evidence of woodland management in the Saxon period. Um, the oak coppice uh, with hazel underneath it um, fits perfectly into this sort of landscape. So there we are, three different sites turning up different sorts of information at different periods, but all adding to um, assist in our interpretation of perhaps the core of the forest itself. Um, and I end with this, this little bit from Kitchen's map in the 18th century, where he shows the junction between the land and the sea. Um, so I like to think this is on the coast of the New Forest. We've got ships um, perhaps being constructed at places like um, Bewley and Butler's Hub. We've got a Hampshire hog here being prepared. Uh, they're about to burn its hair off with this pile of straw, so that could easily have come out of the forest. And then we've got other fruits of the sea. There's a great big basket of oysters here. Um, all of these things are products of that zone around the edge of the forest uh, where interaction with the sea and other people can take place. Thank you.